you are. Jesus had just got done telling you that he, the Son of Man, is going to suffer. He's going to be rejected by leaders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. And then he's going to die and be killed. And three days later, return back to life. And then right after that, he says this. And then this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever, whoever loses their life for me will save it. Jesus, who you're with, is going to suffer, be rejected, be hated, be killed, and die. And then Jesus says, now you need to take up your cross too, which means... You're probably going to be hated. You're probably going to be killed. He's going to leave us. And now he wants us to follow really close with him and do exactly the same things as him and be his close companions. I mean, Jesus, we love you and all, but really? That's a lot to soak in. It was nearly eight days later that Jesus took three of his companions, three of his disciples up with him, Peter, James, and John. They went up on a mountain to pray. And even after these very difficult words, which we just talked about, that Jesus spoke to his disciples, eight days later, these three, his disciples, were following him and were with him. Did they truly understand what Jesus' words meant and what he was saying to them just a little over a week ago before that? And it wasn't long before that that they witnessed Jesus feed the 5,000 with just a couple loaves and a few fish. He healed those who were demon-possessed. He raised the dead, a sick girl who died, and he calmed a furious storm. These disciples witnessed Jesus' miraculous power. They knew that he was more powerful unlike anyone that they had ever met before. But as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. The disciples had witnessed nothing like this before. Not even the miraculous acts of Jesus were at this level. And they were still missing it. Because Luke tells us that Peter, James, and John were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing there with him. This was the best of the best. This was beyond anything that Jesus had done yet. This was so much more than anyone in the world had ever witnessed before. This was glorious. Jesus was transfigured right before them. Jesus was completely changed before their eyes and his humanity was now divine. At that moment, Jesus was glorified. We could ask questions all day long on why Jesus did this and why it happened. But to put all those questions aside, there's only one that really needs to be asked today. Who? Who was glorified? Jesus. Jesus is the best of the best. Jesus was glorified only eight days after he announced he would be crucified. There's no coincidence there. Jesus' glorification was setting, in, setting him up and really preparing his disciples for his crucifixion. Glorification to crucifixion. Transfiguration to disfiguration. Crucifixion and disfiguration to resurrection and eternal glorification. 
Jesus was the one. He was the only one who would be able to fulfill the role and promise of the Messiah. Jesus is the promised Messiah. The one that the Old Testament prophets prophesied about since the fall into sin. Jesus was the one. He was the one to be struck in the heel by the serpent. But it won't be a fatal blow. He was the one who will crush Satan with his glorious glow. Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the one who through his crucifixion, we see God's will be done. Did you notice that there were two men standing there with Jesus at his transfiguration? There was Moses and Elijah. And they were there talking with him. The topic of their conversation is of no surprise. Jesus' departure. Many questions arise here too, and we wonder, well, I wonder exactly what they were talking about as his departure. But there's only one question that we really need to ask here too. And that question stands out like before. Why Moses and why Elijah? It's really the who question again. Moses was the giver of the law. He was the mouthpiece of God, as we saw there in our first lesson from Exodus, where he came down from the mountain and he carried the eternal reflection glow from God the Father as he carried that down and he was there speaking with the Israelites and the priests. That glow radiated off Moses to the people as he gave them the law. Moses was the one that God called to be the one to lead them out of slavery to Egypt and lead them to the promised land. Elijah was one of God's prophets. In fact, many times in the New Testament, we see people thinking and wondering if John the Baptist was Elijah, returned since Elijah never died. Remember, he was the one who was taken up in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. So Moses... And Elijah. Many believed Elijah was going to be the Messiah to come. Many believed that if they followed all the laws that Moses gave, they would enter heaven. Which was true, but none of them could. So Moses, the giver of the law. Elijah, the one thought to be the Messiah, the prophet of God. Moses, the bringer of the old covenant. And Elijah, the perceived Messiah to come pointing to the new covenant. Right there with Jesus, discussing his departure. We don't know exactly about what about his departure Moses and Elijah were discussing with him. But that doesn't matter. What matters was the topic. Jesus is going to be leaving the world soon. And since... 2,000 years has passed since this time. We know exactly how Jesus' departure took place. Was Jesus concerned about how he was going to go and leave the earth? At this time, we don't know for sure. But we do know that the weight of the sin of the world and the fear of being forsaken by the Father was a heavy burden for Jesus. Because as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked for that cup to be removed from him, if at all possible. His crying from the cross was even filled with more overwhelming suffering as he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Certainly, Jesus' suffering, Jesus' crucifixion, and his death were coming. But Jesus' crucifixion was only part of his departure. Jesus also knew of his resurrection and his glorification. And at this moment, while he's glorified right there before the three, certainly this too was part of their departure discussion. 
For Jesus was glorified there on the Mount of Transfiguration to be soon crucified, to three days later to be glorified again. Glorified to be crucified, to be glorified. A cycle that would end at his glorification. So who was his transfiguration for? Was it for the disciples to solidify their faith in Jesus as the Messiah? Was it for Jesus himself to help him see the past, past the tremendous burden that he was going to bear of all the sin and the death that he was going to suffer and even the temptations and the luring of the devil? And all that was looming over him was this transfiguration for Jesus' sake? Or is this transfiguration for us today and all the world to see Jesus as he truly is? And the answer to all of these is yes. It was a glorious event. And of course, Peter, James, and John, they did not want it to end. Peter, in fact, said, did you catch that? Master, it is good for us to be here. And he didn't let it end. He said, let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. We want you to stay. Let's make this event last longer. This is heaven on earth. Yes, this event was for the disciples, but not to be a long-lasting event, but for them to get a quick glimpse of what was to come. But there was so much more to come through Jesus' suffering and his death that this glorious event wasn't to last longer than it already had. It was to show them what was to come after that death. The full glorification, not only for Jesus, but for all who believe in him, was to come. And so God the Father announces for all three to hear, This is my Son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Simple words. And yet filled with much meaning. Basically behind those words and implied in those words are, My Son is going to suffer. He's going to be hated and he's going to die. All who follow him are going to suffer and be hated, but he is my chosen one. He is my son. There's every reason to listen to him. There's every reason to follow him in spite of the fact that he's going to die. And despite the fact that you are going to be hated and that one day he will physically leave you. That's what was all in those words. And so still today, 2,000 years later, we set aside a Sunday to ponder Jesus' transfiguration. For God the Father's words shine down on us from heaven, still to us today. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who fulfilled the old covenant by making himself the new covenant. We know because the events have already occurred. Jesus was glorified to be crucified, to be eternally glorified. It all culminates at the cross. This furniture piece of torture has Jesus' glory written all over it. For Jesus took any thoughts of trying to keep him to ourselves, like Peter, James, and John were kind of wanting him to stay. And he shed his blood selflessly for all people on the cross. Jesus lowered himself from eternal glory in heaven to be crucified and to be separated from his own Father to connect us once again to God the Father and make us his children to last not just as glimpse, but to be with him in glory everlasting. Jesus' glory that day, that day on the mountain of transfiguration, Jesus' glory points us to the glory that he won for us and is there in heaven waiting for us. Jesus is now there, 
ready to welcome us to be by his side in glory forever. Jesus, the glorified Jesus, shines out his forgiveness on you so that you may live a life not fearing the hatred of the world or the suffering that comes with life or even the death that is imminent for all. Rather, the lightning bolt of Jesus' glory is no longer a flash, but a forever fully vibrant light in heaven to keep our heads up and heaven on our mind. Jesus was glorified to be crucified so that you will be eternally glorified. Amen. Please stand. peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord be with you all. Amen.